Well, hello, this is Adam, and welcome to Rare Classic Cars. Today we have a fun one for the Ford lovers. Marquis versus Marquis. Well, Marquis Brome, I guess, technically. But we're going to talk a little bit about the genesis of the Mercury Marquis nameplate with two early examples here, this 1968 Marquis, and then here, this 1974 Marquis Brome sedan. And if there are any Hawaii Five O fans of the original series out there, this will be a good treat. Uh, pretty close to the vehicles that were used, albeit not exactly uh, on the show. There was a 67 Marquis Coupe that was used in the pilot. This is a, a 68, as I mentioned. The main show used a 68 Park Lane Brome hardtop as the principal vehicle. And then later it switched to a 74 Marquis Brome hardtop. This is a pillared sedan. For those who've been watching the channel, the brown 74 Marquis I have is a hardtop. So it's a little bit more common, but in any case, the Marquis uh, came to the Mercury lineup as the range topping vehicle in 1967. And it's interesting that the range topper was only offered as a coupe. You could not get the Marquis as a four door. It was only a two door. And it was quite expensive, almost $4,000 in base price in 1967. Came very richly equipped with a, I would say, you know, very rich interior. 410 cubic inch V8 under hood, making 330 horsepower, and a lot of you know good option content, including power steering and brakes. And then for the 1968 model year, it remained a coupe only, but they decontented it a bit and lowered the base price. I'm guessing because the sales you know really just weren't great. These marquees in these years never sold really over 10,000 units. In 1968, they sold under 4,000 of these. And for viewers of my channel, you may be seeing double. I have two of them. I have this one that's finished in polar white. I have another one that's finished in Wellington blue with a white top. Uh, so very, very few of these are left today in any condition. I've been thankful over the years to find two. But 1968 was the second year, as I was mentioning, of the marquee. Still was Mercury's range topper. They did, believe it or not, decontent it. And uh, power steering was not standard anymore in 1968, if you can believe. This car came standard with manual steering, an almost 4,000 pound car. But still very luxurious for the time uh, and kind of like a gentleman's muscle car, if you will. A lot of people who are Ford fans will remember the seven liter Galaxies with the 428 cubic inch engine under hood. Well, you could get the 428 cubic inch engine in this as well as an option. Car came standard with a 390 four barrel V8, which made 315 uh, gross horsepower. And then you could get the optional 428 four barrel in these. Now, shortly after 1968 and 1969, the Park Lane nameplate was dropped and the Marquis became the full size, whether it was a two door, four door for Mercury, and they had the Marquis and the Marquis Brome trim. So the Park Lane went away. This became both a two-door and a four-door. And then it continued soldiering on over the course of the years uh, into you know, kind of what we now know or remember pretty fondly until the early 2000s is the Grand Marquis. In 1969, as I mentioned, this went, from a, went to a two and a four-door. It also was a new platform. And that platform was used all the way until 78. This is a 74 model which is, has similar underpinnings as the 69 and the 78, but it's the first year of the really big bumpers in the front and the rear, has the five mile an hour bumper standards. And this is a bigger car. The wheelbase grew by an inch between the 68 and the 74. This is a 123 inch wheelbase, that's a 124 inch wheelbase. But with the bumpers and the protrusions, the overall length uh, increased significantly. And beyond the overall length, the weight you know, just ballooned. This car weighs in at a little under 4,000 pounds. This car weighs in at 4,800 pounds. The wagons in these years were over 5,000 pounds, so really, really hefty. And, you know, that's good and bad. 74 to me, my personal opinion, is really the last year that I enjoy the Ford products, the classic Ford products. And after that, they really started decontenting them. On the coupes, you know, in 75, the rear windows stopped going down, whether it's a Lincoln or a Mercury, 
even they started taking out the armrests in the back seat of uh, the marquee coupes. And um, I think the other thing that best exemplifies the cost savings that went into these vehicles between 1974 and the end of the run in 78 is the curb weight. So if I look at the curb weight of this vehicle, it's 4,800 pounds. If I look at the curb weight of the top trim Mercury Marquis in 1978, which was the Grand Marquis, it was 4,400 pounds. So the car lost 400 pounds in weight over that intervening period. Really, as the carpet became less rich, the sound deadening was trimmed, the sheet metal gets thinner, the door glass gets thinner. Uh, so the car just overall got cheaper and more tinny feeling, if you will, compared to this 1974 model. Now, as I mentioned, Marquis starts as a 1967, coupe only. The Grand Marquis, which was what the nameplate that most of us are familiar with, actually started as an optional high-level trim in 1974 on this car. So they had the Marquis, the Marquis Brome, the Grand Marquis. And it had a different interior, different seat stitch pattern, kind of a rib design on the door panels and the interior. I frankly think the Marquis Brome interior looks richer than the Grand Marquis in spite of it being not the top trim. Um, but eventually that Grand Marquis got folded into the overall lineup and the Marquis Brome uh, really got pushed out. So in uh, 1983 as well, they had the Fox Body Marquis that was introduced, and the Grand Marquis was the Legacy Panther platform uh, nameplate. And then that Fox Body Marquis continued until 1987, I believe, when it was sunset. And then the Grand Marquis went on into history. So, just to summarize, Marquis started in 1967 as a range topping coupe. Then uh, in 1969 became the range topping name for both the coupe and the sedan. The Grand Marquis started in 1974 as a trim line on the Marquis that you could option up. And then the Grand Marquis really locked in to being the name of the car once the Fox Body Marquis came into play in 1983 and the Panther platform car became the Grand Marquis. That's a bit of the history, but let's also walk around and talk about these vehicles because there's so much to talk about. They're so different in spite of the fact that, you know, there really aren't many years separating these two cars. Uh, but everything from the curb weight, the styling, the philosophy, unfortunately the horsepower <laughs> is also different between them. Let's talk a little bit more about that in detail. Okay, so let's start with the 68 Marquis here, being that it's a bit older. And as mentioned before, these did not sell well at all. They sold about 3,900 units in 1968, which was about half of the number that they sold in 1967, in spite of dropping the base price by about $300 from the mid-3,900s to the 3,600s. And they did that, they decontented it. Uh, there was no longer the 410 cubic inch engine. This came standard with the 390. They made uh, power steering and power brakes optional, as well as some other equipment too. So they decontented their range topping car. This car is finished in polar white. It's one of about 400 with the dark red, I think it's called Rufino crinkle vinyl seats. Great color for the interior. This particular car originally came from North Carolina, hence the front license plate. And when I was living in Raleigh, North Carolina, I actually went to go look at it locally. Didn't end up buying it because it needed quite a bit of work. It had been sitting for a long time, thought the price was a bit too high. Then about three or four years later, it popped up for sale and the person who bought it from North Carolina and did a lot of work to it was selling it. And I ended up buying it because it was essentially the same price as when uh, I could have bought it in North Carolina, but everything was fixed. It just needed stuff from sitting, nothing major, all, you know, brake work, air conditioning work, etc. But what great lines on this car. I always loved this fastback roof line, of course, the Park Lane Coupe and the Monterey and Montclair uh, two doors had an even faster roof line. This was the more formal roof line. This car does have some options. It has the optional wheel covers here. The standard ones 
uh, we're just a black center. This has a red center actually, protrudes out a little bit farther from the body. It has the twin comfort lounge seats, power steering, power brakes, power antenna, AM radio power antenna, standard 390, four barrel V8, twin comfort seats, the split bench with the armrests. I believe that was also, they made that optional in 68 versus standard. It's just a handsome car. Interestingly, in 68, the LTD was the cheaper model, but it had the hidden headlights. The Mercury had the exposed headlights. So a cheaper solution on a more expensive car. And I do find it funny that they do have this pinstripe from the factory on the lowers here. I'm guessing the designers really wanted some piece of trim there and it got costed out. One other great thing about these Fords, when you close the doors, GM never quite got this, nor did Mopar. So it sounds really good. And it's just so solid, and it doesn't take much effort. I, you, know, you can let go of it, and it closes all on its own. <clears throat> the Mercury's in these years, they did have this really neat dash in 67 and 68 with, I call it the Cyclops speedometer, the big round speedometer. The dashes are different between 67 and 8. In 68, it has more of this hood here over top of the gauges, but the climate control and the radio are in the same location the vents you know a little different and you can always tell the option content of your mercury's by how many levers you have down here to pull so this car if it had the rear window defogger would be a separate knob actually underneath this faux wood grain trim there were uh, options for rear speaker faders the power door locks which would be something like this over here if it had cruise control there would be a pull lever as well to activate, you pull that out first, then you'd push the set button at the end of the turn signal stock if it were so equipped. Beautiful door panel. Car obviously doesn't have power windows, but you know, just drive it on nice days. So I park it in the garage and leave the windows down. Just a very rich and inviting interior overall. Let's take a look at the trunk, which is humongous, as well as the under hood. Also, one year only steering wheel for Ford, the safety padded wheel. The flower pot 67 wheel on the Fords was also a one year wheel. All right, so let's take a look at the trunk. And one unfortunate thing about the trunks on these cars is the keyhole placement is far from optimal here. It tilts downward and it's a little tough to get the keys in. You can see there's a few scrapes here from somebody with a previous uh, key ring opening it. But there's the trunk, complete with some 8-track tapes. I forgot this does have the 8-track tape player in it too. There's the power antenna motor. Spare tire, spare tire cover, the floor mats that somebody bought. Those aren't Ford factory, they're aftermarket, but they're what came with the car originally. Ford always had this funky jack set up in these years with this spring that holds the jack in, and you see I've got a little cloth there. It kind of rattles a little bit. Sometimes you hear it, so if you put a cloth on it, then it stops that noise. Not a great design. A tremendously huge trunk with the low floor that was facilitated by the gas tank being vertically placed here as opposed to the GM and the Mopars of the era having the gas tank underneath here and the lower license plate fill. This car has a fill on the driver's side. So it's good and bad. It gives you some good cargo space but there's a pretty high lift over here that was not overly convenient. Ford customers seemed to like it. They stuck with it all the way until the last Grand Marquis uh, that came off the line in 2011, I believe, this kind of setup. So it was very popular. GM had it in the early 60s on the full-size cars, but the 65 to 70 generation did away with it. Let's take a look under hood. 
So here we have the 394 Venturi. Ford always liked the Venturi nomenclature here. That's not four valves, um, if you're thinking in normal, you know, current day parlance. And by the way, if anybody has one of those ring stickers for a 394 Venturi, I'd love to own it. Apparently the vendor got in a dispute with Ford over it, so you can get these full ring stickers with a two Venturi, or you can get the 428 four Venturi stickers, but this one you can't. So if anybody's got one or knows how to make one, feel free to email me. But you can see it's an air-conditioned car. This is the York two-piston compressor. Later Ford would go to the GM A6 compressor just to get more cooling capacity. You can see this is two and a half pounds of R12. The GM compressors of the time were running in the high threes to the mid fours in terms of the charge of R12. So just more BTUs, although this is a almost a one ton BTU system in this car, 12,800 BTUs. So imagine that, you know, if you've got a, let's call it a 13, 1500 square foot house, you probably got a two and a half ton air conditioner. This is a one ton air conditioner in this car. Pretty big capacity. The GMs would have even more. And <clears throat> the 390 is a really nice engine some strange things. If you ever have to change the heater hoses, you pretty much have to remove the fender because they snake inboard there. So that's not ideal. But other than that, most everything is accessible. Always check your the clutching fan. I find on these Fords that they tend to they tend to be dead by this point in time and then you risk overheating the viscous fluid just when the car is hot does not become viscous and then consequently this fan doesn't spin as fast as it should. This one I've changed, it's got some good resistance you know even here but something you really want to be aware of otherwise the car is going to overheat. When this fan is operating appropriately uh, and the car is hot with the air conditioning on you should really hear even at idle the, a, a lot of the air and the noise associated with the air getting pulled across the radiator when these fail, you can almost grab these blades and hold them while the engine's running, even when it's hot. Wouldn't recommend that though. Don't do that. So let's start it up. This has the anti-theft feature of not being able to find the keyhole very easily. You can't see it when you're sitting in the driver's seat. It's kind of hidden. Not a great, not a great thing, but it's there. I do love the cold light they have on these. Running perfectly. I did put factory style duals on this car. It needed a new exhaust. It came standard with singles. But I wanted duals. Sounds better. Allows the motor to breathe more. Super cool back end on these as well. A lot of people think this is Cadillac inspired, which it may well be. Could also be inspired by the 64 Pontiac design, the kind of the crescent shape, Mercury's riff on that. It's hard to say. And it's hard to say Pontiac is probably a copy of the Cadillac. So everybody was playing off one another's themes. But a cool back end, really only used in 67 and 8. 67 and 8 have the same bumper and taillight formation. 68 has this trim though, this kind of chrome trim on the lights. The 67 does not. The 67 light is more plain. So that's it for the 68. Let's talk about the 74. Thanks for watching part one of this comparison test. Stay tuned for part two which will include a walk around the 74 Marquis Brome as well as a ride and drive of both vehicles. 
Until then, be sure to check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right, and like, comment, and subscribe on this video. Thanks again for watching.